Moving on to discuss pneumonia. The hallmark, the defining situation with pneumonia is that you have infection of the alveoli and that causes consolidation. So that is where the air that's in the alveoli has been replaced by an inflammatory exudate, bacteria, white blood cells and red cells, replacing the air. And you can see that on the chest x-ray. So for example, this chest x-ray shows somebody with a right upper lobe pneumonia and there's a white patch over the right hand of the lung and that reflects the dense consolidation that's occurring in that area and there's no air left in those alveoli. And this distribution of pneumonia is a lobar pneumonia. It's affecting one lobe only and the rest of the lungs are clear. And that's the commonest presentation of an acute pneumonia. You can get pneumonia which is patchy throughout both lungs. So little patches throughout both lungs. And that's called bronchopneumonia. And this is an example of that. This is a much more serious disease in, in general because that's a very extensive uh, infection and is often a fatal event in patients with underlying severe disease such as a cancer or another disability such as uh, dementia or, or a chronic um, neurological deficit of some description. A third pattern of pneumonia that we can see is an interstitial pneumonia. Now you probably can't tell very easily on this chest x-ray that it's abnormal, but there is a widespread reticular nodular infiltrate in both lungs, but it's very subtle. And that represents, again, a diffuse pneumonia and is commonly associated with the atypical organisms that I mentioned earlier, mycoplasma and chlamydia. The overall importance here is that if you have pneumonia, there is some form of alveolar consolidation, usually lobar, but potentially interstitial or bronchopneumonia as well. And we can detect that clinically. So if you have somebody with pneumonia, the area of infected lung, the area of consolidation, will be dull to percussion, and when you listen to it, there will be crackles in that area and potentially bronchial breathing. And the chest x-ray, as we've seen, is obviously abnormal. It shows airspace shadowing with white patches in the affected area and occasionally what we call air bronchograms. That's where the bronch bronchus that's moving through the consolidated lung has been delineated by the alveolar consolidation either side of it. So it shows up as a black tube going through a consolidated area. So pneumonia is classified into different types. And the first and the most important and the subject of most of this talk today is community-acquired pneumonia. And that is what it says in its name. It's a pneumonia that is acquired when you're living at home and not in hospital or anything else. So it's the normal standard pneumonia that you pick up in your everyday life. There's a subcategory of community-acquired pneumonia called healthcare-associated pneumonia, which has been defined recently in America, but probably is not relevant in Europe. And I'm not going to discuss that in any more detail today. That is a pneumonia that occurs in people who are in long-term care facilities, nursing homes, etc. But in fact, in Europe, it's probably not that much different to normal community-acquired pneumonia. And therefore, we, we group it with community-acquired pneumonia. The other important forms of pneumonia are hospital-acquired, which, as it says, is a pneumonia that you develop when you're in hospital. So you're admitted to hospital for another reason, say you're having an operation, and then after the operation you develop a pneumonia. That would be a hospital-acquired pneumonia. It's also those patients who've been in hospital recently and then come back in with a pneumonia because the organisms that are causing that pneumonia have probably been acquired whilst they were in hospital previously, they are also defined as hospital-acquired pneumonia. A third form of pneumonia is ventilator-acquired. That's basically a subtype of hospital-acquired pneumonia, but it means that this is pneumonia in patients who are on the intensive care unit being ventilated with an endotracheal tube inserted. And they are susceptible to pneumonia because the ET tube, the endotracheal tube, bypasses quite a lot of the normal immune mechanisms for pre preventing infection. And the last category is immunocompromised host. These are patients who have a very severe defect of their immune system, and that allows a range of unusual organisms, bacteria, viruses, and fungi, to cause the pneumonia. So the, the, the chance of having a, uh, a pneumonia to an unusual organism is much higher in these patients. But we're talking about patients who have severe immunocompromised state. So those who've had chemotherapy for cancer, those with HIV infection with poor CD4 counts, those who had transplantation of their marrow or of a kidney or their lung, etc. So patients really with very severe immune defects. 
So who gets pneumonia? Well, there's an easy answer to that question, and that is absolutely everybody could get pneumonia. It's not uncommon in young people, but it is particularly common in two age groups, the very young, the under fives, and as I mentioned before, it's the commonest cause of death across the developing world in the under fives, and the elderly. And there's an almost exponential increase in the chance of developing pneumonia after the age of 65. So it ends up that the chance of developing pneumonia in somebody who's very old, over 85, is about 5% a year. The risk factors for pneumonia also, as well as age, include previous influenza or other viral infections. Because, as I mentioned in the influenza lecture, a viral infection of the respiratory tract affects the immune response to bacteria and allows bacterial infection to develop as a consequence of the viral infection. So secondary bacterial pneumonias after influenza are very common. And that's the major way by which death is caused during the pandemics or has been in the past. For example, the post-World War I pandemic, which killed 20 million people. Most people died of pneumococcal and staphylococcus uh, pneumonia after having the influenza virus infection. Other people who are more susceptible to pneumonia are uh, p alcoholics, uh, or people with liver cirrhosis because that affects the ability of the immune system to fight bacteria. Smokers that allows the bacteria to establish infection in the lungs more readily. Actually, having had one episode of pneumonia makes you two or three times more likely to have another episode. It marks you out as somebody susceptible to pneumonia. And then patients with chronic disease. Chronic lung disease, COPD for example, chronic neurological disease, dementia, previous stroke, etc. Any renal impairment or cardiac failure. These are all reasons why you are, uh, all, these all increase the chance of getting community acquired pneumonia. Now, if you have hospital acquired pneumonia, you need to be in hospital. So if you're hospitalized for, one, for an, a reason, then you're at risk of hospital acquired pneumonia. And if you're ventilated, then you're at risk of ventilator acquired pneumonia. And the risk of that is about 1% per day that you are ventilated. And then, of course, the patients who have immunosuppressed for their treatment of their cancer or because they've had a lung transplantation, etc., those will be at risk of, immunos of pneumonia of the immunosuppressed patient. What are the symptoms of pneumonia? Well, actually, they're very straightforward. You have the systemic symptoms that you get with infection, fever, feeling unwell. Occasionally, you get the shakes, the rigors, and you're not eating, and you feel terrible, and you want to go to bed. Then there are the focal symptoms you get because it's a lung infection, and that will be cough, producing a purulent sputum sometimes. Sometimes you get blood in that as well, and the mixture of purulent sputum with blood becomes what we call rusty sputum, a sort of browny color sputum. You may get pleuritic chest pain if the pneumonia is causing overlying pleuritic inflammation. That's called pleurisy. And because the pneumonia consolidation is affecting the ability of gas exchange in your lung, then you might be breathless as well. When you look at the patient and examine them, again, you have the general examination findings of somebody with a, a, an acute infection, pyrexia, they don't look very well, they may have a tachy, well, they should have a tachycardia, and they have an increased respiratory rate because of the, the problem with the consolidation. There are a few other issues. They may have herpes leb labialis, so herpes simplex infection of the, around the mouth actually often reactivates during people with pneumonia. And if they have significant hypoxia, then they'll have central cyanosis. And pneumonia is a, com a relatively common cause of acute septic shock, so they might have hypertension as well. And occasionally, patients have atrial fibrillation because acute lung infections are one cause of, of temporary atrial fibrillation. So that's the general examination. When you listen to the lung, we've already mentioned the signs, which essentially is focal asymmetrical cr crackles, crepitations over the areas of consolidation. If it's really dense consolidation, it'll be dull to percussion and there'll be bronchial breathing as well. And about a third of patients with pneumonia will have a small effusion and some of those will have a pleural rub. So if somebody presents with pleuritic chest pain because of the pneumonia, the pleurisy, it's quite likely that there'll be a pleural rub over the area where they feel the pain. Now, if you're trying to work out whether somebody has a pneumonia, or an acute tracheobronchitis, and this is a very important distinguishing, distinguishing situation because tracheobronchitis is a relatively benign disease and will settle, whereas pneumonia does have the potential chance of becoming a very severe disease.
then there are a few of these things, which these signs, which are important. So, for example, you will not get crackles if somebody has a tracheobronchitis. So the focal lung signs that you get in pneumonia are not present if somebody has a bronchitis. In the general examination, if you have an acute tracheobronchitis, it doesn't cause impairment of respiratory function to a significant degree unless you have an underlying lung disease. And so in a normal patient, there shouldn't be an increased respiratory rate. They should not get cyanosis. And it should never get severe enough to cause hypertension or a particularly high pulse rate.